that being said, some of our most interesting retrieval research is actually when we are unable to retrieve things correctly. And so forgetting is the notion that either we can't retrieve it or when we retrieve it, it looks a little bit different. And so we're going to start off by talking about some really uh, popular memory glitches that a lot of us experience, then talk about amnesia, which tends to be a little bit more rare, and then move into interference, which is neither here nor there. It's kind of its own little interesting part. So when we talk about memory glitches, this further helps us to understand why our mind is not like a computer, why the human brain just doesn't seem to work that way. And the first one we're going to talk about is transience. You can see there's six here that we're going to jump into. Transience, absent-mindedness, blocking, misattribution, suggestibility, emotional bias. So we're going to first start with transience. So transience is the idea that over time our memories fade away. It's the idea that we have what's known as decay or the forgetting curve. This is totally normal and if we don't constantly try to remember our memories, they will go. At the same time, the memories that we are constantly rethinking or the anecdotes we constantly tell ourselves, those memories get strengthened. And so we are um, going to think about fewer but more clear memories as we get older. So certain things from our past will stick out more. So the forgetting curve is the idea that we begin to fade away. Then we have absent-mindedness. Now we talked about this in unit five already. This is the idea that we have a saturated cognitive load. We have a heavy load on our hands. We can't possibly pay attention to everything. And it's because of this, our brain cannot encode everything it needs to. And if it never encoded it, we can't retrieve it. If you're not paying attention to where you put your keys, you're not gonna be able to find your keys. And so this is what happens when we have a lot of implicit mind wandering. We are trying to do a task, but our mind is somewhere else. And so we're not doing it mindfully and we're not able to retrieve it. Then we have blocking. Blocking is the idea that you might be in the right area, but you're not able to retrieve something. And this happens with our schematic networks. This is the idea that you are trying to recall what you need to get on groceries and you swear it has something to do with produce, but you walk around the produce aisle forever and ever and ever and realize when you get home, it wasn't produce at all, it was toilet paper. So why does that happen? Well, this is called blocking. It's also called the tip of the tongue phenomena. You know that you know it, you just can't recall it. It happens when you know someone's name or you know the name of phenomena or you know the answer and you know that it's there in your brain. You know that you're storing that information, but for whatever reason, you went down the wrong synaptic pathway. And because you took the wrong way at a fork in the road, now you're here and you cannot retrieve the information that you know that you need to retrieve. And you say it's at the tip of your tongue because you're fully aware that you have this information and you're just not able to currently re retrieve it. Number four is misattribution. Misattribution comes into play when you forget where you heard information or learned information or you forget who you shared the information with. So there's a couple different ways this can work. This can work when you go to tell someone a story and they roll their eyes and say you've already told me that and you didn't realize that you already shared that information with that audience. Misattribution can also be when you go to pass along information, but you pass it along to the person who gave you that information. This could be especially problematic if there was a secret that you're supposed to keep really tight and you promise to not tell anyone and then you share it back to the person who told you. Now they know you're not going to share the secret. And so that could be really problematic. To pretend against misattribution, we tend to do two types of monitoring. We do source monitoring and reality monitoring. Source monitoring is when we try to monitor who we heard information from and we try not to retell them. And reality monitoring is we try to be aware of if we actually already did a behavior. This may be telling someone or it might be doing something like packing your suitcase before you go camping or uh, putting it at the campfire before you go to bed. Now when we do reality monitoring, what can happen here is both internal and external monitoring. Internal is when you think over in your head, did I douse the campfire? Did I pack socks in my suitcase? And internal monitoring is the idea that you think it over, you say, aha, uh -huh, I do remember packing socks. But if internal monitoring fails, then we can go to external monitoring. This is, I can't remember if I packed socks. I think I did, but maybe I'm breaking that up. Maybe I need to go check my suitcase physically. So this is when we open up our bags and we double check that we have actually done things. Or I'm actually not sure if I dosed that campfire. And we leave our tent and we make sure it is fully extinguished. And so this is the idea that we are double checking because we're aware that our memories are a little bit fallible and not perfect. 
Now, we're not always aware our memories are not perfect, especially when it comes to suggestibility. This is the idea that we remember false information and we stand by it and we believe it to be true. This can happen sometimes in priming. This is when somebody says, oh, watch for the stop sign in this video. And at the end of the video, we say, oh, oh yeah, I definitely saw the stop sign. Or if somebody says, um, look for the color blue when the color blue might've been minimal, but we really pay attention to that. So that's the part we remember the most, even though that wasn't the main part. So prime is when somebody suggests something which really alters how we're going to encode things. Then we have leading questions. This is when somebody asks us a question that doesn't alter how we encoded it, but alters how we retrieve it. A very popular study done by Dr. Loftus was the idea people watched a, a film about two cars which collided. And after watching the film, they were asked a series of questions. And some of the questions that participants got were either how fast were the cars going when they dinged each other, when they collided into each other, or when they crashed into each other. And depending on what verb they received in their questionnaire, they had very different answers. Crashed makes it seem like it were going much more fast versus dinged makes it seems like they were going slow. In addition, when those same participants were invited back into the lab on a second occasion, those who had been used, those who had been given questions with the word crashed on the first occasion, recalled, re remember seeing broken glass on the pavement, even though that never actually happened. We know that we can make up completely false memories for instance, if we were to work with participants' family members and use doctored or photoshopped images of a time that their family went to the circus and they were invited to go and stand with the ringleader at the front. And we said, remember the time you went to the circus and you stood with the ringleader? The first time we tell them, we say, that never happened. But then if we keep asking them, remember the time, remember the time, and we show them photos, what actually happens is they say, oh, I do remember the time. And then they add and they flourish it with their own new information. Oh, I remember we got peanuts that day and it was so good. And we got a glow in the dark bracelet. And I remember seeing that, but the music of the cannons were so loud. But the, and so this is the idea that they're starting to flourish and make up even more false memories. Now, if you recall, when you remember an event from the past, you're not actually remembering the original event. You're only remembering the last time you accessed it showing that every time you recall this fabricated circus, uh, you're going to add more details to it and just change it slightly so that it grows and changes over time. This is why two people who remember the same event, every time in their mind they recall it, it's going to change a little bit more and a little bit more so that a couple years down the road, they remember completely different concepts of what occurred. And how we remember things tends to be very shaped by our emotional bias. We find that the memories we remember the most clearly and for the longest in our long-term memory tend to be very detailed memories called flashbulb memories that can play out like a movie. The flashbulb comes from an earlier time in our history when photography was done with these flashbulbs, but it's the idea that we can play out something like a birthday or a graduation or a loss of a loved one as if it is a cinematic film. We can also develop flashbulb memories to big global events that impacted many people such as the bombing of Pearl, Pearl Harbor, uh, the assassination of JFK, 9-11, and in the last 20 years, maybe it was an election outcome. And so this is the idea that you might remember exactly where you were when you heard the news. You might remember watching it on TV and knowing who you were sitting with and where you were. I was 17 years old and in grade 12 on the morning of 9-11. I was in my third period class, Global Geography. I know where I was sitting in the classroom. I remember the teacher, he came in and he put his back up against the cinder block walls, his arms were behind his back, and he broke the news to us. And that's exactly where I was. I remember in fourth period, we begged our teacher to watch it on the school monitors. And I remember going home at lunchtime and viewing it on the news with my parents. I don't think I'm gonna lose that memory because it was so intense. So what makes a flashbulb memory a flashbulb memory? These detailed narratives tend to happen when it's something really intense. So this usually is something really happy, or really scary or really sad. So that's why we tend to see these life milestones become flashbulb memories like weddings, birthdays, graduation ceremonies, and big traumatic events. So it has to do with what's going on. But in addition, our memories get shaped by our emotions. If you have an interaction or a fight with someone, based on if you're feeling forgiving or you're feeling frustrated, you're gonna remember that argument differently. 
based on our emotions, you're going to remember that interaction a lot more differently. So we have huge emotional biases in terms of how we remember something and what we remember. So now that we talked about some of the common memory glitches we experience all the time, let's talk about something that's a little bit more rare, and that is amnesia. Now we all vary in terms of how well we can remember things, and it is on a normal curve, but amnesia is not really low memory, it's more of a lack of memory. This usually results from a brain injury, although we commonly think of amnesia as having to do with late stage uh, dementia, that's not exactly the same as amnesia. So amnesia can happen at any point in the lifespan, at any age, but for our purposes, let's think about someone who is about middle-aged, and let's assume they had a brain injury at the age of 40, on their 40th birthday, let's say they get into an accident. Well, their amnesia can look very different, and there's lots of different subtypes. One type of amnesia is retrograde amnesia. This is when they wake up after the accident, after the brain injury, and they have a loss of everything in the past. They cannot remember their retrospective memories. So in retrograde amnesia, they can't remember the past. They can't remember their childhood. They can't remember old timey music or anything that happened before. They might not be able to walk or talk and have to completely relearn that as well. Maybe their semantic memory is okay and they just lost their retrograde episodic memory, so they don't know who they are, but they can still walk and talk. It can vary if you think about the other subtypes of our memory. They might actually have their implicit memory and know how to do things, but don't really remember making those memories. They might have lost their explicit, but not their implicit memory. We could also have a person who on their 40th birthday gets into an accident, uh, incurs a brain injury, and when they wake up, they still remember who they are, but now they have a very different type of amnesia known as anterograde amnesia. Anterograde amnesia is the idea that they know who they are up until the brain injury event, but they can't make new memories moving forward. So a year later when they turn 41, they can still remember their whole life up to 40, but they don't know anything from the past year. And so this can be even more distressing. This is a person who can't make new memories and can't learn now. This is someone who anyone who they met in the last year or any events that happened, they don't know. They go back to the time of the brain injury. And it has to do with how they can encode and store the new memories. Of course, you can always get a combination of both retrograde and anterior grade, or you could have them completely separated. Now, the last thing we're going to discuss in this unit is the notion of interference. So we saw these pictures before. These pictures were here when we were talking about retrospective and prospective memory. If you recall, prospective memory is what is currently going on, and retrospective memory is what has happened in the past. And in addition to retrograde and anterograde amnesia, we have two final words to know. We have retroactive interference and proactive interference. So without amnesia, without anything extraordinary happening, we tend to experience retroactive interference. Retroactive interference is when our new stuff, our new bedroom, our new pet dog, our new best friend or significant other is blocking our memory of our old bedroom, our childhood dog, and our childhood best friend. In retroactive interference, what happens is you're so used to what your bedroom looks like now, you can't imagine your bedroom when you were a childhood. And when you're petting and cuddling your dog now, the memories of your childhood pet have faded away. And when you're talking to your best friend now, you forget what it was like talking to your best friend as a child and you don't remember anything about them or their likes or dislikes. This is very different from prospective interference. Prospective interference is the idea that we're not really able to encode and retrieve the new information because our memories of the old information is so salient. This is the idea that when you go to climb into bed, you put your hands up to go climb into your bunk bed, not realizing you no longer sleep in a bunk bed or you call your pet dog by your old pet dog's name, or you call your best friend or significant other by your previous significant other's name. That would be prospective interference. This is the idea that you are thinking of the past and that's blocking your ability to focus on the future. You might experience this a lot when it comes to passwords. You might forget what your current password is. Maybe it's so new you've only entered it a few times and you constantly enter your old password. So that'd be prospective interference. So this was a bit of a shorter unit, but well done, you've made it to the end of unit seven on memory.